All right, everyone, um, let's get started. It's a great turnout, really, so thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Eperamian. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies here at Berkeley. I'm also the faculty chair of the Center for Research on Social Change. Um, uh, really quick, I want to um, thank some of our sponsors, which include the Joseph A. Meyer Center for Research on Native American Issues, the Center for Research on Social Change, the Center for Race and Gender Social Movement Working Group, uh, Native American Studies, American Indian Graduate Program, and the American Indian Graduate Student Association. I want to ask you all to please uh, turn off your phones. I'll give you a few <coughs> seconds to do that. Um, so just to remind everybody about the, our, our traditional format of the event, uh, the guest speaker is going to speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up and have a, a Q&A. Um, so that said, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Professor Andrew I want to mention uh, jo Jolivet, Jolivet, who is a professor of American Indian Studies uh, at San Francisco State University. He received his PhD in sociology from UC Santa Cruz, and he's uh, the author of five books, uh, Cultural Representation in Native America, uh, Louisiana Creoles, uh, Cultural Recovery and Mixed Race Native American Identity. Uh, he's the author of Obama and the Biracial Factor, uh, Indian Blood, HIV and Colonial Trauma in San Francisco's Two-Spirited a two-spirit community, and a research justice methodologies for social change. Uh, Professor Jolivet uh, currently serves as the interim executive director and principal investigator for the San Francisco American Indian Community Cultural Center for the Arts. And uh, the title of his talk today is Research Justice, Methodologies for Social Change and Social Transformation. Um, I just want to point out really quick, so I've been teaching the research methods classes, um, the social science research methods courses in ethnic studies uh, for the last few years, and you know, we're constantly trying to um, reconcile between these established kind of Western ways of developing knowledge, of collecting evidence, right, to create social uh, knowledge, right, and I think those of us in ethnic studies have kind of sometimes have um, questions about using these types of uh, colonial methods right, to, to create social change and, and oftentimes we try to figure out what are ways we could use these things for liberatory purposes right, and what's left out of the, of the methods, right, especially in the social sciences and I think the obvious ones that we always struggle with are how do we incorporate things like, like love, how do we incorporate things like um, romance right? how do we incorporate things like spirituality into our knowledge making and producing processes. And I think uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, invite um, Andrew to talk about this is because the, the book that he came up with, which I use chapters of in my class, I think really is an important first step in trying to deal with some of these issues. Um, so I'm lo really looking forward to his talk today, maybe talking a little bit about the book in general and then maybe the process of, of how it came about. So uh, joining me and welcome. You. There's some seats scattered about so folks, unless they, you know, if you guys want some to sit, there's a bunch over here, yeah. <laughs> Just offering if people are more comfortable back there too, that's fine as well. Okay, I'll front row it, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Ruptures. Ripped from Earth's red skin, pinched, pulled, stretched out against time, ruptures create soul wounds. Wounds of a thousand nations, of dissolved centers, softening like wet cotton. All the scars slowly stain, slowly soak in. Ghosts haunt as we sleep, as we wake. No place for memory to hide. No place for memory to resolve, to resist. We are haunted, we are broken bone and ash. We are ancient mounds desecrated. We are contaminated water underneath ceremonial rock. Here in the cracks of earth, we emerge out of the wombs of dead mothers, haunting spirits we become. Colonial haunting attaches and affixes itself to our children, gone in the sun of a thousand dancers, our spirit traumas remain. Invasion syndrome re-triggers every trauma, every moment of settler violence. And yet here in this new morning light, beneath Spanish moss and eucalyptus, among smells of venison, salmon, and koan. We begin a new fire so our people can eat, so our people can dance, dance a dance only grandmother's feet recognize. We begin again, we sing again, we gather again. 
In ceremony, we wipe every frozen tear. In ceremony, we restitch every ruptured body, every ancestor memory. In ceremony, we return to our knowledge systems. We unmask our truths in multicolored blankets and shawls, exchanging skin, blood, and what's most radical about love, our vulnerability to become reborn. Here in our return, we reach out and whisper to the sacred. We hear you, we remember, we remain. We are ruptured no more. We are dissolved no longer. We are rescinding every haunting, every rape, every unsober moment for a return to the sacred. Look there to the moon and see that the sacred is in the undilated pupils of your sisters, of your brothers. Look to the elders, turn to the youth. Be your own healing, be your own truth, be your best medicine. There in the return may all sacrifices be remembered, may all hauntings be dismembered, may all ruptures dissipate into springs and creeks along the land. Where Indian blood, yes, Indian blood, means finally we are free, free to exist, free to love, free to remember, finally we are free. Alito, good afternoon. Um, thanks for all coming out. Um, let me begin by acknowledging and giving all thanks and honor to the uh, Chechenyo Ohlone and other indigenous peoples of this territory. Um, I'm Andrew Jolivet, son of Annette and Kenneth, grandson of Gertie and Howard and Isabel and Andrew, uh, and uh, great-grandson of Francois, Rosina, uh, Eva, and Edward. And I wanted to introduce myself in this way following cultural protocol um, so that you know um, where I come from and why I'm standing here today. Um, I want to also acknowledge each of your ancestors who made it possible um, for you to be here today. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the pain and trauma that many of us may be experiencing as a result of the recent presidential election. While this outcome may have produced triggers for many of us, we should stand in solidarity with all of those working for a more just and equitable society for queer, trans, immigrant, Muslim, indigenous, working class, women and people of color, communities, poor whites, that have historically erased under a settler colonial U.S. hegemony, right, our experiences. And so that it's, it's only when we push back, right, and shift and um, change the narratives and discussions together collectively <coughs> can we make change. Because no matter who would have won an election, we, would, we still should be grieving because we're not where we should be. So whether Bernie Sanders had won, whether Hillary Clinton had won, whether Angela Davis was the president of the United States, well, maybe not. <laughs> um, I think, actually, the reason I mentioned her, because I've been saying this to people in some talks recently, I was at San Diego um, earlier this week and then at Santa Clara yesterday. Um, Angela uh, was at this talk I went to, I think it was with Yuri Kochiyama, and uh, it was actually for a film some years back in Oakland, and she said, uh, it was actually, two, well, not some years, it was right after the 2008 election, because Obama had been elected, and people were asking her, oh, what do you think? Things should be getting better, right? And she said, mm. she said, yeah, I mean, I think he'll be all right, referring to Obama. You know, um, he's a little bit more in line with our thinking on some of these issues. Um, but what we always do, whether it's in politics or in the movement itself, is we get behind people and we put that one singular figure up in front and in charge and then we go back and we let them take, take you know, like they're going to fix everything alone. We have to stay on them. So my point in saying no matter who is elected, who's the president, it's our responsibility, it's our job to stay on those folks, keep our feet on their neck, right? Um, and it's also our job to care for one another and I think that, that, that this research, this process um, speaks to some of those issues that it's really important that when we talk about things like the sacred or something being ceremonial, I take that very seriously, right? Um, and I think that we have responsibilities then, all of us, to do work um, uh, with one another. And I, I don't mean that in the sense of being allies or folks putting on safety pens, right? What I'm referring to is, because I heard of, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Bishop Yvette Flunder um, from City of Refuge, and she talks about the fact that the term ally is very transactional. It sounds almost as if I'm gonna su I support you because um, there's something in return, right? That I alleviate myself of some sense of, you know, I did the right thing, right? It's almost like volunteerism versus like service or organizing. Um, she said, we lose our own community concepts uh, for what it means to be um, family, right? 
Um, and so when we talk about a return to our own knowledge systems, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, so in 1995, James Nason, uh, who was then director of the American Indian Studies Center at the University of Washington, carried out a survey um, of uh, tribes, right, in the United States, uh, Western United States, and among First Nations communities in Western Canada. Uh, and he wanted to see who was controlling the research activity and how research, w research was basically being conducted. Um, Nason identified four key concepts with the research process in Native American and indigenous communities and nations, right? So he said, these are four significant problems that we see. They're not, old, they're not um, new problems either. They've existed since, you know, sort of initial relationships. So the first was the inappropriate use, right, of uh, culturally sensitive information, especially spiritual information. It looks like there's a little change in the trans in sending this file over um, when you use different... Um, Applications. I see the lines are a little bit off. Um, so, for example, in this first point, right, inappropriate use of culturally sensitive information, especially spiritual information. Anthropologists going to ceremonies, for example, and reporting what they find. That's not things, that's, that's to be kept in communities, right? As I was telling the folks at Santa Clara University yesterday, one of the things, particularly in Native communities, I was telling them this story about Richard Moves Camp, um, a medicine person from the Lakota Nation who had come to my American Indian Religion and Philosophy class a number of years ago. And Richard was talking about, it's okay to invite non-natives into spiritual space, but you have to be invited. You can't invite yourself and then take over that space, right? For example, one of my students who was also in that class was talking about the Native American church, actually over here in Berkeley, and how he went, and there were no Native people anymore. They'd run them all <laughs> off, right? <laughs> Um, and so th this was a number of years ago. I don't know what the status is now, but this kind of thing, right? And so another thing, a professor of mine, he actually was a student here many years ago, uh, Michael Sosi. Some of you may, I don't know if anyone in the room knows Michael. He passed away last year, but he used to, you know, kind of joke too about people going down to the Mojave Reservation, uh, or Colorado River, and uh, saying, you know, people would tell them that these people coming in to do research the wrong thing on purpose because they knew what they were doing with this information, <laughs> right? They tell them your breath stinks, right? Is it, it, or the words, right, that they would use, right? When they're telling them, they're saying, oh, well, this is our word for cleaning, you know, or something like that. It actually meant something else, right? Like your breath stinks or something. Second point that Nason points out is commercial or uh, other exploitative uses of information, right? <laughs> We see native names everywhere, right? There was this big case, and well, Lenola Duke wrote this piece um, in uh, one of the first anthology I edited, Cultural Representation in Native America, where she talks about um, crazy horse malt liquor, right? Mm -hmm. And the use of crazy horse's name, right? Which was never supposed to be spoken again at his request after he passed away, right? Um, and how that then becomes this way in which we use the commercial, right? The other is a friend of mine, Sarah Sutler Cohen, she did work when we were at Santa Cruz together on corporate or neo-shamanism, where you have these non-native people who put on workshops and will teach people the ways, right? And they say, oh, it's not native, though. Then you, it's, it, if you haven't seen this film, it's old now, it's like, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s, uh, white shaman plastic medicine men. Mm -hmm. You have these people staying there and then talking about how a bird, creator sent a bird down on their shoulder that sat there and told them what their Indian name was, right? Um, um, so these kinds of ways in which people are exploiting people's information, I think, is it's really important for us to think about that. Um, third, he talks about the unauthorized infringement of individual family or um, this type of this thing got messed up really bad. Um, family or ownership rights over songs, stories, or other information. Um, <coughs> And so really, when you share personal information with people, fam people's family stories, um, you're changing the way in which um, you're representing people. You have to think about that. When we go out and collect research, first of all, why do we, I mean, maybe I'll pause here even just for a second. I want to play. Well, why do we do research in the first place? What do you think ultimately, if just like, maybe it's one word. What's the goal of research? One word. You can just shout them out. What's the Ten goal years. of research? Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> What's Proof. the Proof. Proof. Learning. Learning. Healing. Healing. Someone said, what did you say in the back? Snitching. Snitching. Mm -hmm. Other reasons to do research? Evidence. Evidence. Making things better. Yeah. It's hard because all of these, there's ways in which we can look at what are the, the, the problems actually with all of those, right? Even making things better, which is what I would hope to say is that 
sociologists, right, we always would argue or talk about what is the goal of sociology? Is it to reform society or to transform it? Those are very qualitatively different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think that's what research justice is also asking is that we actually transform, reorganize, restructure the actual power relations that exist um, in, in the uh, social order. Um, the fourth point he raised is potential conflicts or harm resulting from the research, including uh, harm that uh, comes from inappropriate interpretation of data, inappropriate intrusions um, into community life, and breaches of confidentiality and friendship, right? Because if somebody's telling you their story, particularly in Native community, they trust you, right? It takes years to build those kind of relationships, um, and so it's really important that we not sort of, you know, allow that, I think, to continue. So mm -hmm. before I kind of get into the PowerPoint, I, I wanted to share a little bit of background on where research justice um, came from and a little bit more about um, Nason's points. Um, in the late eight, 1980s and early 1990s, many tribes began to create their own research protocols. Um, so this is the, the Hopi, the um, Navajo, for example, nations have their own research protocols. I was sharing with the folks at UC San Diego that actually in our department in American Indian Studies, we actually worked on our own cultural protocols because what is IRB for? Why do we have institutional review boards? To protect the university, not to protect people in the community. Right? Um, and so we have to think about that relationship so that people are still doing things respectfully. It doesn't mean you're doing it respectfully just because you're following IRB. Mm -hmm. right? And so um, I think that that's really important for us to consider too. Um, and the importance of Linda Tay Smith's work is central, I will say, in terms of its influence both of the Data Center, which is an uh, organization that was in Oakland. Um, I think many of you have even heard of the Data Center in Oakland. Yeah, you all know that the data center closed its doors earlier this year, unfortunately. Um, I was the uh, vice chair of the board there for a number of years, and um, I'm, I want to kind of share some of the background into how this all started. Um, but I think when we look at the work of scholarly work of um, Smith, right, and others, her book, Indigenous Methodologies, created a swell, right, in other folks concerned with issues of research methods um, and how methodological questions um, facing Native peoples are very significant. Um, so in other words, um, many indigenous scholars and community leaders are exploring the importance of practice and empirical research in the face of struggles to establish indigenous scholarly and intellectual traditions. So for example, what I mean by this, um, NASA, you all have heard of NASA, or some of you have maybe heard of NASA, it's the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, one of the, the largest Native American you know, um, organization. Much of the work there is structured in a way to ask questions about uh, a whole range of things, right? But some might argue that it's a little theoretical, right? If community members actually show up to the conference, will it jive with what the community sees as the issues, right? Are we actually letting the community drive the questions or are we, the, are we walking into the community with our questions, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where the research starts, right? With the question. So as a, you know, per, uh, Opelousa, uh, which is a band of the Atakapa Ishak Nation, a member of that nation, it's really important to me, I think, that we challenge these um, issues of ongoing settler colonialism. And I follow also the work of Cree scholar Sean Wilson, um, his book, Research as Ceremony. He asks us to understand how the very nature of our research methods and theorizations might change if we consider our work to be ceremonial. When we as Western scholars hear words like sacred and ceremony in the same sentence with methodology or settler colonialism um, or, um, you know, empirical data, things like that, we can often act in ways that reify the very colonial narratives that point, excuse me, that continue to haunt, reduce, and make indigenous peoples and other communities of color invisible. So during my own um, time as a research fellow at the uh, University of Washington at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute, I was fortunate to work with some really powerful women indigenous scholars, um, Karina Walters and Bonnie Duran, and they also raised important questions about the field of Native studies um, and how we do meaningful work that produces everyday change in the lives of those most vulnerable within our communities. Mm -hmm. I also gained an appreciation at Erie for the statement, we don't need more Indian experts, we need more expert Indians, right? So in other words, when we think about our communities, we need more people who are, the people in our communities are the experts. The elders are the experts, right? The children are the experts, the knowledge keepers. People going and setting, you know, um, uh, prisons, right? And prisoners, the prisoners are the experts, right? But we say sometimes, who's, who's an expert, right? Um, so consider the following words from Miho Kem. Miho Kem was the executive director of the data center for many years and... Um, 
uh, coined the phrase research justice. And so this was, um, some of this comes from the preface to the book Research Justice. Approaching its 30th anniversary in 2006, Data Center began to ask itself, how could we strengthen the impact of community-led campaigns and organizing by actively putting strategic information in the hands of communities leading change? As a backbone of support organization for the social justice movement, we observed that very few communities had the capacity to craft the right research question, let alone harness the power of information to take calculated, purposeful action. In fact, organizing approaches that integrated research were few and far between. Community leaders who were neither social scientists nor policymakers possessed unique insights into genuine solutions to issues they addressed from experiencing those firsthand. But theirs was a talk story. Then there was real, quote unquote, real research done by, quote unquote, smart people in the sciences, the currency at the policy making table. So she goes on to say, right, that there's this idea, right, when you're trying to have these discussions to resolve these issues, these tensions, who do we really actually listen to who's sitting at the table? First of all, we should always be asking who is sitting at the table when we're um, conducting research. She says, many of our experts um, began to look at how to shift policies, right? Or many of our efforts to begin to look at how to shift policies, she means at the data center, um, were geared toward impacting disenfranchised populations, right? Uh, and they led to key victories, she said, you know. Um, yet there was a palpable trepidation, she says, in embracing research among grassroots organizations. And she says, this is true because, as Linda Tay Smith says in her book, and most of you haven't even read her indigenous methodologies, right? where she says research is considered a dirty word to indigenous peoples. I don't think it's just them, right? Um, uh, the Henrietta Lacks story, um, some of you I'm sure have read that as well. Where these traditions, this science come into play that it actually scares communities to the point that they don't want to engage in research by outsiders or among themselves, right? Karina Walters, who I mentioned at University of Washington, she gives this great talk of this story. She was um, doing research around obesity with her, with her nation, the Choctaw Nation. And they, they, she went down there, and, and all the kids were having, you know, diabetes issues and obesity. She said, "Why the?" She said, "Let me." She said, "What do I start?" So what she did, she just went and was having conversation. They're eating. She's talking to the, some of the elder women in the community. She said, "Why are all the kids? Why do you guys, if you know this is happening, right? Why do why do you keep eating this stuff? Or why would this, you know, this problem?" They said, "It's because when we were on the walk, right, um, the Trail of Tears, Choctaw too, right? We always focus on Cherokee sometimes in that story." the um, people became, they were starved, right? So they don't want, they don't want to remember that, right? That's the, the sort of pain, how do you heal the survivance, right? What are the ways in which you um, keep going? So they actually went on a walk and retraced the steps mm -hmm. of their ancestors as a sort of a method or an intervention into rethinking this. Same thing happened with the HIV AIDS crisis when gay men, right? Why do people have the stereotype of gay men in the gym pumping, you know, weights and getting all buff and huge and stuff? Or to keeping true because they became emaciated during the, they, no one wanted to think that people to think they had AIDS, right? So the ways in which people respond to things, and so you ha we have to be creative in terms of also listening to the community and not making assumptions about why people are doing that. Oh well, they have the knowledge. Why aren't they changing this behavior? There's something always underneath why people do what they do, um, and so she goes on to say that they launched a two-year uh, movement uh, assessment on research oppression in an attempt to unpack the hidden barriers to grassroots ownership of research. Um, through this process, she says, they identified at least five ways in which inequity prevailed in research. First, they said there, she says there was a lack of access to accurate data about themselves. Right? So lack of ac uh, accurate data. Then there was a miss or under-representation of those communities in mainstream data sources. Like if you go, when I was doing research for Indian Blood, the HIV text, you know, I was looking at national surveillance data and things like that. And you know, they don't even list or they weren't even looking at issues for not only just Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, right? Um, uh, other Pacific Islander groups, um, Arab communities were not really being looked at, right? Because we, we also are lumping these. They're really only looking at white, Latino, and black, right? Anybody else was not really being looked at in a very material, serious way. Um, she says, third, there's an assault or violation on individual political and collective cultural rights justified by data-backed allegations of criminality and immorality, right? So think um, the new Jim Crow, um, Alexander's work about prisons, right? That um, we then sort of um, create this, this sort of myth, right? That people are creating these problems for themselves because they are inherently immoral, 
right? So the data actually backing that up. Um, so I think that that's really important. Then there's a lack of um, community control. And this is the most important one, I think, for the data center and for research justice is that there was a lack of community control over production of research, documentation, right? possession. And then she doesn't say it here, um, but later we talk about it. Um, well, actually, she does. It says, and use of their own data. So dissemination. Mm -hmm. Who gets to decide also where the data goes? Particularly at the research level, right? Graduate, student, right? Your master's mm -hmm. thesis. Where does it sit? Library. Who reads it? Maybe somebody doing research, and they might incorporate their no offense if you doing your master's. Um, <laughs> is and and in your PhD, your dissertation, if you're fortunate, you'll and have the energy left, you'll revisit it, right? And it'll turn into a book or a series of um, articles. Um, and 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 that and then after that, it's it's just what do you do with this stuff? What is the impact of it? Um, so she also talks about in order for the reality of the research justice framework to come alive, right, to, to, to happen, she said she, they believed at Data Center that it had to be community driven. Um, we have to see research as a vehicle for the community to reclaim, own, and wield all forms of knowledge and information as political ammunition in their own hands in ways that are consistent with the community's unique cultural and spiritual identity, values, and traditions. So she also says that all methods of producing the building blocks of our own worldview and realities must be recognized as equally valuable and relevant, if not critical, on par with those validated and accepted in dominant institutions. So what people say when they try to do something right, when I was meeting, I was meeting with graduate students at UC San Diego too, and they were saying, you know, I want to put like a film, like they're going to use a film for the final chapter of their dissertation, or they want to do this or that. And it's like, what faculty some, we sometimes tell folks, right, when they say that is, oh, well, that's not really going to fly, or how you do it, or do you know how to do film, and um, are you going to get a job, right? <laughs> Our concern becomes, you know, these other questions that, have, that we lose sight or track of why we began the project in the first place. So a couple things she says that are really important for the movement that really got started at Data Center was that they felt that, you know, communities had to have access to information, not just the misinformation, they had to, to have the ability to define what is valid knowledge, um, the capacity to produce um, their own knowledge. A lot of this is about capacity, right? Capacity to use all forms of knowledge and to control all stages of the knowledge life cycle, right, from beginning to end. Um, and so she says, we argued that research justice is in and of itself a racial, economic, and social justice agenda. Um, and so basically the, from there, in 2007, Data Center convened a community forum um, on research justice. It was uh, hosted by the San Francisco Foundation, um, where Ron Rao was a program officer at the time of the social justice program. Um, and they wanted to create a local venue, right, among um, social justice allies um, to bounce off their brand new idea, right, of the research justice initiative. And it's been taken up all over. I mean, I've been surprised where I go and people are talking about research justice in all these different places in the book, people are already doing it, right? Um, at UCLA, at the Labor Rights Center, um, in undocumented communities writing, they're the ones who wrote the piece that's in the book themselves, right, about their experiences working with other undocumented communities, for example, or women who are part of black women's birthing circles talking about the importance, right, of what the experience of going through that collectively together meant as a form of healing, right? Um, that they are their own, that they are the authors themselves is really important. Another guy who co-wrote a piece about prisons with one of the prisoners that he was going there initially to study, <laughs> right? That he, you know, how to help, how he be can become a co-author of his own work. So eventually, um, the data center from 2010 to 2014, um, in their strategic priorities document, provided a clear trajectory based on the mandate from their allies and social justice movements, other nonprofits, radical um, justice-leaning organizations like Movement Strategy Center and others, um, decided that they wanted this to be central and that they wanted to do more campaigns. They began working with Michelle Fine, and, uh, who introduced the data center to Linda Tay Smith. And um, it was in 2013 that we, ha uh, along with Margaret Reed, who I don't know if anyone here may know Margaret if they're in ethnic studies, um, she and I were the co-chairs of that conference. She was a PhD student here in um, ethnic studies at the time finishing up. And um, we had this event titled uh, Decolonizing Knowledge Towards a Research Justice Praxis. And it was a really important event. And at that point is where we said, we have to publish this also in the sense and write it and include people who are doing this kind of work 
um, almost as a, a as a handbook or a beginning stage to say how do we do this? What's different about this from community based participatory research or participatory action research? Right. Um, I think the step that goes further here is that it's um, what um, Michelle Fine Miho says describes this story that Michelle Fine sort of talks about it as opening up this intellectual sauna, right? about the importance and power of transforming research methodologies and practices from the margin to the center, right? I think in CBPR, we don't necessarily talk about who owns the research or how it, or how it gets disseminated. It's really much focused on just process, not necessarily outcomes, too. So I think these are important things that we kind of have to look at. Um, now here, um, I think we have to return, right, to address some of this stuff, some questions for indigenous peoples, just to talk about it from this way. Um, and I think all of our communities have this, right, is our original instructions. What were we told to do in our communities when there were problems? And even in our own families, even now, right, even as living as in colonial or settler colonial context, what did your families tell you to do when you had a problem? You all, we all have sets of original instructions. That's what I mean by it, right? Um, one of it, the ideas I think that's important when we think of our original instructions about how we how we treat one another, how we live, how we address problems, um, is also to see our, and validate our own human experience, right? But for so long, right, we're stuck on subjective and objective truths, right, and debates and tensions that become meaningless after a certain amount of time. So we don't, like I have mentioned already, we don't need more um, people who are experts on Indians, right? We need people who are actually in the community doing this kind of work, creating institutions, programs that speak to the needs of our own specific communities and problems. Linda um, Tewai Smith and her husband, who's also does research with the Maori people in Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand, um, they have a university for indigenous, a PhD program. They're training indigenous scholars from all over the world in this university about knowledge systems, educational programs, GIS mapping. I mean, all you name it, they're doing it. Um, and also, indigenous knowledge systems have to keep in mind notions of self determination, right? And I think that's the key piece also about research justice is ultimately we want the folks we're working with, the communities, whether we're studying, you know, issues of public health, um, you know, among middle schoolers, that they have some sense of their own self-determination in making their choices. Because what we often have is that we're thinking about, oh, well, people know the knowledge, they have the information, why do they keep doing these habits? It's also about feeling this sort of sense of that you have your own sense of power and agency, especially in a world where you're often told you're less than, right? Mm -hmm. I've been asking audiences this when I talk to them, too. How many of you have ever heard someone uh, tell you that you're sacred? Anyone? I think that that is, when I ask that question, people first of all think, huh, I'm sacred, mm -hmm. right? I think that we live in a world that every day beats people up, no matter what you look like, no matter who you are, no matter what community you come from, no matter what experience you had, right? In different ways, obviously, right? Um, with different sort of manifestations and outcomes. But as we start to think of our own selves as sacred, as we start to think of others as sacred, how does that shift and change the way that we then interact with research, with people, with individuals, right? Uh, with groups, how we organize out in communities, how we study, right? How do we shift that? And so I think that also can help lead to self-determination. We also have to have in our original instructions a sense of act, an active disruption of settler colonialism, right? This idea that um, we're still living in, a, in an occupied country, right? How do we deal with that? And how do we deal with the folks who are here still as settlers, right? And then those who came not by choice, mm -hmm. right, but are here as settlers. So research justice. Research justice um, ultimately is a strategic framework and methodological intervention. Right. Um, it seeks to transform structural in, uh, inequities in research. Right. And it does that right by <coughs> who it includes in the process and who leads it. Right. Research justice centralizes community voices and leadership in an effort to facilitate genuine, lasting social change and seeks to foster critical engagement with marginalized communities. So it's about relationship building, right? Ultimately, is how do we build relationships with folks? And then we're, we're ready, we're trying to finish the research project, right? We're on a timeline, right? We gotta get it done for the thesis or the dissertation or for the book contract or for tenure or uh, the grant or whatever way in which we did that, right? <coughs> 
the community is not on the timeline. I mean, other than the fact that people's lives are on the line, mm -hmm. right? That's the timeline. So we have to remember that. I think that that's really also very essential. Um, community experts. This is what I find to be the sort of crux of research justice is that we really um, center our community as our experts. I'll tell you, for example, some of you may have heard about this last year or last spring, even at San Francisco State, um, there was a big battle over ethnic studies. Yeah, some of you maybe heard about it myself and a few other um, faculty worked very closely with some of the <coughs> students who eventually would decided to go on a hunger strike. Um, the reason I bring this up is that when I think about ethnic studies or any academic discipline, this is not a new question, right? It's how do we continue to engage with community? Mm -hmm. Do we summon community, right, that created ethnic studies only when we were in, in jeopardy, mm -hmm. right? Particularly in the aftermath of the election results, do we only think about community when they're coming for us, when we know folks are going for the community right now, every day, all the time? How do we actually make sure or ensure that we are always being informed by the community in terms of what we research and that it's thoroughly integrated. So research justice calls upon all community experts and witnesses to violence, legal violations, right, educational and health disparities and other inequalities to be active participants in processes for change and policy reforms. So if you're having um, meetings, like say I went to a focus group uh, recently that a friend invited, uh, uh, they're trying to start an African American wellness hub in Oakland. and. Um, it was focused on LGBT community, so they're doing these different focus groups with different segments of the population. It's fine to do the focus group, but then how about when it opens? Can those people also be the ones who, do we just get the information and buy, we're gone, right? How do we keep those folks engaged or actually leading and then running the focus groups? Right? Going and taking those same questions to other folks in the community. Um, or for example, I'll, I'll use a personal example. I had started because I was just sort of having all these thoughts in my head I said about you know, I'm doing a lot of work in the Native community, and I also am seeing all this stuff happening in the black community, particularly to black men. So I started this black men's space mm -hmm. um, to talk about, because there's organizations that do exist, right? There's the uh, African American Male Achievement pro pro uh, um, Project and, 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 and many others, right, the, uh, that are going on. Uh, Life is Living, the people who run that and organize that. But for example, what about the people who are actually leading it themselves? Do they have a space to decompress, to talk about issues? Um, but one of the things that comes up when you even do something like that is how do we make sure that everyone is doing this? So I, it made me think of Cuba, right? Has anyone been to Cuba? Um, in, in, in Cuba, they have poly clinics, right? And the, the, the model that no one gets left out, right? Is these health clinics where there's almost like something in every neighborhood right mm -hmm. and doctors will go to your house if you don't show up right how did they do that Cuba the this country that's represented no resources right um, it's that the knowledge is permeated throughout the whole nation right I had um, some high blood pressure issues going on while I was there on a public health and um, uh, anti-homophobia week that they were having there they, um, and so this um, one of the women that I met there, she's the first PhD in Cuba uh, in nursing. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm going to be your nurse. You said, you're not feeling well. And so we're chatting, and she says, no, you should go back, and we're, we'll talk to the, the, the nurses and stuff. And they're all saying, okay, you need to go get some water, put some limon in it, a little bit of sugar, agua con gas, right, with the bubbly <laughs> water. And, um, that, and, and make sure you take your shoes and socks off and walk on the cold ground. Right? Then I go to the hotel. I'm talking to the person at the front desk. She's like, oh, why are you back so soon? Blah, blah. Same thing. She says, you need to get some agua <laughs> con gas, a little bit of sugar and some limon, and then go upstairs and walk around on the cold floor. It'll drop your blood. The kids know it. Everybody, like the knowledge, right, that it is becomes embedded in the system, right, is what I'm talking about. So how do we spread this is my point, right? Is it sort of like when I was first getting into education at the K-12 level was this idea of each one teach one? How do we continue that where once that this gets replicated, it's like teacher pipelines that people are doing, um, how do we do that in other areas as well, particularly as a part of the research process? So research justice right, exa also examines the relationships and intersections right, between research knowledge, construction, and political power and legitimacy in society. It also recenters community partners as vital partners. The data center believed that research justice right is achieved when marginalized communities are recognized as the experts, as I said earlier, when they wield and own right the knowledge and the information process. 
Um, and so they really talk about their vision for acknowledging th three fundamental aspects of research justice if we want it to be a movement. Strategies for knowledge construction and self-determination have to be central. Strategies for communi community mobilization have to be central. And third, strategies for social transformation and policy reform have to be central. So the book, Research Justice, is actually divided into those three areas mm. um, in terms of the chapters and things like that. Sorry, you guys want me to go back or people typing that? Okay. I can also send this to anybody who wants it. Okay. So knowledge production, the other piece here that was really central is how we produce knowledge, how we understand it, right? So they say, right, the data center, the Western view of knowledge today is shaped like a pyramid, right? And uh, mainstream knowledge is on top and experiential knowledge, cultural knowledge, and spiritual knowledge are on the bottom, right? In the data center vision, there is equal power and legitimacy for experiential, cultural, and spiritual, as well as mainstream, right? So this is the model here that's in the book that will look better probably in the book than this um, thing that I took a photo of to get it. Um, right, but you can see here um, you know, on the um, circle, right, their vision, the data center vision is that it's like this, right? It's, 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 it's moving, it's circular, it's not sort of like this. And this is the challenge ahead of us in so many different areas of contemporary life, right? Is how do we shift the ways in which we interact where one way of thinking, one way of producing knowledge is not valued more than another. It's always been fascinating to me is why we have, uh, for example, education. Um, school is separate from where you go to get your health. And then that's separate from where you get to go to get your prey on if you do spiritual things or do religion. Why have we created in the West all these fragmented parts, right? So it makes it all the more difficult to actually feel like complete and whole people. So one of the things that I talk about, and I talk about it here in this book, but originally talk about it in um, the book Obama and the Biracial Factor, The Battle for a New American Majority, which was really about shifting demographics and how multiraciality actually plays into that. But I think radical love is something that, like um, the concept of research as ceremony, is important because if we have a sense of radical love, how does that also shift the way in which we attempt to interact with um, research, research participants, um, and how do that inform the ways in which we respect the work that they're doing. So radical love right, is this fundamental aspect, I say, of sacred research, of sacred research justice agenda. Right? It requires that we see these participants as our own family members. Right? What if you, I mean, some of us do, but if it, how did, let me actually ask that question. Let me pause for a minute, and I'm gonna, I am gonna wrap up here in a moment too, so we can do questions. But let me ask you all a question, and that's, how does research change if we see participants or folks involved in the research process as family members? Does it change or is it the same? More careful. More careful. You want to protect them. You want to protect them. Yeah, more reciprocal. More reciprocal. Mm -hmm. I think in many sense this shouldn't change because that's the way we should always treat it on, mm -hmm. you know, people who we study with. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. The thing you said about it be, it's more reciprocal, though, that's the key we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what Sean Wilson talks about in his work. About He talks about relation, relationality, axiology. Um, he talks about how we build relationships and how we make them reciprocal in the research process. It should be mutually beneficial, not just for the researcher, but also for the participant. So radical love is... Ultimately, though, it's about being vulnerable. Um, it's a, about being unafraid to speak out on issues that may not impact us directly. Radical love should ask how the work in which we are engaged helps to build respectful relationships. And specifically, this is a quote from the book. Um, oh, actually, there's two. This one is actually from um, the book Indian Blood book, not from Research Justice. And it's actually about my own experience as an um, HIV-positive man. I actually was diagnosed with AIDS in um, 2002. Um, so I've been living with AIDS for about mm, 14 years, just this past October is the anniversary. And I talk, you know, in the book about, you know, I was very sick. I had 35 T cells. My viral load was over 500,000 copies. Today it's undetectable. I have 1,100 T cells. But I had the, went to this prayer meeting um, with a friend and um, some friends that organized it, Dan Freeland, who's um, the name medicine man. And he said, you can't think of yourself as sick. There are a lot of people out there in our communities who are going through the same thing that you are. And you can tell your story, and you can help them to tell theirs, and in that way you can be a part of the process of mending the hoop that ties us all together. We don't all get to tell our story. Many have passed on. 
you have to begin to think about what healing means and what wellness means and how there is all kinds of medicine out there but the greatest medicine is your brother and your sister you are your own healing mm -hmm. the reason I shared this quote as an example of radical love as something that it means when we expose ourselves and we're vulnerable that that's how your brother or your sister becomes your own medicine because who are we going to be most comfortable with to actually get to the stage of vulnerability mm -hmm. and when we get to the place of vulnerability is when we pull back the mask right and actually make some sort of change right um, but it's ongoing. We have to think about it as healing is an ongoing process. So that's why, like a lot of people lately, I've been talking about trauma a lot. I've been talking about white trauma. Actually, people are like, oh, I don't want to hear about no white trauma. <laughs> They're like, you're trying to let people off. I said, what else do you call it when we have intergenerational trauma in native communities, communities of color? I'm not saying it's the same, right? The context is different. But if it exists, if we only talk about white privilege without talking about white trauma, we're negating and ignoring the fact that people their ancestors not only owned enslaved Africans, right, or ancestors not only, you know, displaced, right, and perpetrated genocide against indigenous peoples, but allowed children to watch these incidents, these things, these acts, these horrific things. Mm -hmm. So until we actually deal with that, talking about white trauma is not letting white folks off the hook for anything. It's actually holding folks accountable, in my opinion, for thinking through pain. Because mm -hmm. people of color and indigenous people sure are thinking about pain all the time and have had to. Right, so that, I think, is what's really important here. Um, and so that's what I mean by radical love. And it should, you know, really think about how the work in which we are engaged helps to build respectful relationships between ourselves and others that are involved in social justice movements. So how do I help, how do I think about, like, when we were doing this thing at Ethnic Studies last semester? Oh, you could see it. Even there, right, as an example. Departments fighting over who, well, we didn't get represented in that. It's like, are you the students sitting in that damn tent starving? Why are you worried about your particular program only, right? Instead of thinking about those students or about the other programs. Radical love means putting the needs of others sometimes before our own, right? To a certain extent, right? Now, if you're starving, yeah, of course, you got to, if your department's starving too, you need to do that. But it's just interesting the way these politics also can play out in social movements and within social institutions. Mm -hmm. So finally, radical love means asking ourselves if, we are, if what we are contributing is giving back to the community, and if it is strengthening the relationship of all those involved in the process, is what is being shared adding to the growth of the community? And is this sharing reciprocal? There's your point. Is what uh, we're working toward leading to a more peaceful and equitable society? If, if it's not, don't do it. Right? Something I used to kind of build on, and this is the last slide, um, to build on this notion of um, research justice that I talk about in the book is... Um, collective ceremonial research responsiveness. Um, and so it has these three sort of components to sort of guide whether we should or shouldn't do research, particularly I would say in this context, with indigenous communities, with marginalized communities, communities of color. Um, and basically it defines research um, processes as a collective endeavor and a shared knowledge creation process between academic and community researchers. Um, it creates, maintains, and engages with the knowledge that is produced by community experts, traditional knowledge keepers, as well as cultural leaders. But only, this is the most, I think, fundamental part too, only research that is responsive to the social, legal, economic, cultural, and political policy needs as identified by community experts should be conducted. So I'd like to end with this. It's, it's called we, we Remain. No time shall pass, no secret shall remain, no night shall fall, no day shall begin. Begin without the sun pointed at your heart. Begin without the meeting of the soft white pebbles, motionless and solid yet transformative still. My rock, my stone, my ancient temple of remembering. remembering. Open, untold and shadowed stories of remembrance. You were born at the intersections of revolution and defiance. The lines in the arches of your back and in the curves of your feet speak lifetimes of triumph, speak songs of joy, as you enter, I begin. As I begin, you continue. And in this lake of urban forgiving, we renew once more that sacred hoop of sustenance, where hearts cross, where paths intertwine, and where our journeys continue. This last thing I wanted to share with you all is really just also in thinking about the work that you do. Um, and I hope you'll keep this in mind, um, is that 
we have a privilege in sitting in this space to be able to talk about these kind of issues mm -hmm. uh, and then to be able to now go out and, and, and think about what we give back to the people that we work with. And this is just called give it all to the people. When shadows come, when disaster strikes, when sorrows invade, give it all to the people. Give your love, give your heart, give your commitment, give it all to the people. When you fear failure, when you are silenced by machines, when you have lost your will, when you lose sight of footprints in sand, give it all to the people. Give your breath, give your light, give your vulnerability, give it all to the people. Make the people your sacred love. Make the sands of immortality your salvation. Make love to justice, make love to city streets. When all around you seems unforgiving, give your breath, give your spirit, give your talent, give your will, give it all to the people. Give as it has been given to you, the people, your mothers, grandmothers, the people, your fathers, grandfathers, the people, your ancestors, your ancient ones. Give it as it has been given to you. Sacrifice, nurture, love unconditionally, whisper beauty through concrete walls, whisper beauty through institutional systems, whisper beauty in day and night. When all around you seems like defeat, give your breath, give your spirit, Give your talent, give your will, give it all to the people, and remember, you are sacred, you are sacred, you are sacred. You are of and by the people. When you give, you become free. When you give, you become flesh, the flesh of all the people. You become rebirth. You become the light. You become the, a link. You become all the ancient ones. You become the answer. You become all the people over and over again. Thank you. Before we start the QA, I forgot to mention in my intro that there's a books for sale outside and there's a discount for release of Chef Discount. Um, yeah, just if you're interested, uh, um, uh, we have questions. Thank you so much. I wonder if could you please give us some example of how um, in your research concrete can you put these principles into practice so we can also learn from a, an example like a bird, please? Sure. Um, so for example, I'll talk about my own. Um, the latest project I did was um, this book, Indian Blood, HIV and Colonial Trauma. Um, when I first started, I was interested in this issue. I also knew that HIV and AIDS was a topic that had not been talked about very much um, in Native communities, particularly when the, within the context of how mixed race identity impacted Natives. Mm -hmm. But when I went in and thinking, I was thinking of, well, I want to focus on gay men, and um, that was it, right? Because most of the studies were on uh, what we call MSM, men who have sex with men, which was not specifically gay men. So I go down to the Native American AIDS Project because they're a native-based organization, right, who's doing HIV AIDS work. And I meet with them and through conversations, first of all, we build a relationship, right? So we start talking about where are you from, who's your family. Um, next though, we start to have conversations. What are the needs? I said, well, what are the needs here? What do you think are the actual needs? And so then the um, person I was working with at the time, Gail Burns, um, she said, you know, our transgender community is really um, one of our, has some of the more pressing concerns, you know, we, you know, that, so I, she said, basically, she was like, you need to look at that, <laughs> so that changed the study, I included transgender people in this study that was once going to just be on gay men, um, and so I think part of it is like sort of listening and, and trying to build a relationship and understand what, what's going on, but also I listened to community members too and folks at the agency about, um, outcomes, right, or, um, what kinds of questions to ask, um, how to um, formulate the research. And even at the end of that book, there's an intervention, right, design model. It comes from the participants, right, the idea for it, because they talked about the, the, the model was that it's an intergenerational cultural leadership model. And what they told me in the focus groups was, we need leadership too. We don't want to just tell a story that's sad about risk for HIV, but also how are we actually resisting it? And But also what we need is there are gaps between generations that came here through relocation or California natives, if they're California natives and have always lived here, between the younger and older generations. So it's a mentoring program that um, they would also, in the intervention, the way it's designed is that they would actually come up with 
um, the questions, right? Um, the write-ups about it, um, and also then where it would get disseminated and shared. And so that's one example I can think of. I would say that the data center and other people who've been who, who were using this was um, actually giving people the specific tools themselves so they can keep doing research after you leave, right, the community. So whether that's bringing in software, right, if people want to do GIS mapping, I know they were doing that with the Winnemum Wintu tribe who were looking at sort of creating a map of their sacred sites. Um, and so they gave them the resources, technology, capacity, right, which I was talking about, to do that work and to continue to do it once data centers out of the picture, right? Um, someone who I think does this work but doesn't maybe call it research justice, my colleague at San Francisco State, Melissa Nelson, she runs the Cultural Conservancy in San Francisco. They often do that. I know they were working with the Paiute tribe, um, for example, on their sacred songs. Another um, example of they went in, brought equipment, helped produce this film that became an uh, award-winning documentary at the American Indian Film Fest. But they left the tools with the Paiute to actually, they're recording their songs, right? Because they had been lost during the boarding school process. But they're able to now trace and map also to where were all the sites where they would go and hold ceremony. And they don't need you know, cultural conservancy anymore. Um, there was a project in Marin that the data center led, and some of this is a little bit in the, in, in the book. I don't talk as much about um, all the stuff data center did. There, the chapter's about all these different sort of topics. Um, but the data center was working with um, immigrant and undocumented communities in Marin, um, where they actually were concerned about what were, like, living um, conditions there, and a report was produced. It was produced by the participants. Right, um, so that they were able to then be informed. You know, I talked a lot about policy. Well, then when there's actually meetings and they go and there's something happening in the city of Marin, they're empowered actually with the knowledge they've created and found themselves to go to that meeting and be able to say, hey, you know, like when people have neighborhood or community meetings, right, and they're saying, oh, we're going to bring in some change to the neighborhood, we're going to build this or build that. Now they know, right, what are the issues, the situations, conditions. Thank you. Yes? Thanks a lot for your talk. A lot of the research justice agenda you present is for um, a community we imagine to be disenfranchised, marginalized, community, so the research is community controlled, community driven. What if we substitute this community for one that we imagine not to necessarily be a vulnerable population, so real estate developers, mm -hmm. tech CEOs, how much does the frame framework carry over? Mm. How much sacredness do we assign to these people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good question. Good question. I think that even in that case, that's why I talk about white trauma, because that's the very reason why they don't under like that folks in those positions may or may not understand when someone says there's such a thing as white privilege. Right? <laughs> so in terms of breaking down those things, I think in those situations if you know that there's unequal power or those folks are in the positions of power, right? Uh, or have more powerful positions that you want to conduct research with, I think you still, it's, it, that's why the reciprocal part, the relational part still applies. Because if you're building that relationship, you're asking the similar questions. Because you don't just let the, like I think the idea is not just, even if you're talking about sort of marginalized groups, people aren't just running and with these uh, the idea themselves per se, you're still engaged in a process with them to talk about systems of inequality, right? So I think the same principles and ideas apply when you're talking about, you know, bankers, right? If it's Wells Fargo or whatever. Because what would we say, for example, if we have to be even more concrete then in terms of well, what would we want to know about them, right? Are we just going to write about how they're doing all these awful things, right? Because then if we are, we're not really gonna probably talk to them. We might talk to employees, right? If we're gonna do research, this is not the research justice model, right? I'm saying just typical research. Might read reports and write this scathing thing. Now, that could have impact if you know, it's something, revealing something we don't already know, but otherwise we're basically saying what people already know, right? So if we really wanted to actually produce change or produce a research justice outcome, then I think it's actually um, doing that work with those people together to kind of look at what is the impact of your work actually having, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it actually does still hold, um, even when we're talking about groups that hold power, right? if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, in the context of <coughs> research justice, you brought up things like uh, conducting more appropriate research or more equitable knob cycle or self-determination of grassroots ownership of your research. Um, other countries have actually attempted to formalize that. And if you're mm -hmm. familiar with Canada, they have OCAP, ownership, control, access, and possession mm -hmm. in the context of First Nations communities. Mm -hmm. 
And is there any, uh, is, in an Atkins context, you can't even apply for and get a CIHR research grant unless you demonstrate you follow those principles. Mm -hmm. Is there any movement or push for that happening in this country? Um, not at a federal level that I'm aware of, there could be, but what I would say, A, is that we need to look at um, UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which does prohibit some of this, right? And there's actually several principles in UNDRIP that actually talk about research with Indigenous Peoples globally. Um, but the other place where this is happening is among the nations themselves. So certain tribes, you can't get in to do research for the exact same reason. You need permission to go in. Um, so I think that's similar, but I actually think we actually need research protocols in all of these various different communities. I think community-based organizations should start creating these. I think neighborhoods should start creating protocols. Schools, a little different, right, because you can't get access anyway sometimes with schools if they're K-12s. But um, I think schools also need to um, be thinking about these um, <coughs> cultural protocols. If people are going to come in, what do they need to do in order to come in to do that? Prisons, again, it can't be just about sort of protecting the institution of the prison, but there need to be cultural protocols that prisoners themselves write. Um, and I think this is the work yet still to be done, so it's a great question you ask. And um, I think in other nations, just like here too, people are creating stuff where they are um, leading the research themselves, but not also then create... Um, creating ways or mechanisms to actually make ensure that the people who are coming in aren't doing things that are harmful, mm -hmm. right? We're leaving that in some cases to institutions who, you know, send researchers in. And just maybe to contextualize that, if people haven't heard about it, if you work with a native community in Canada and you're conducting research, they own the data. Mm -hmm. and they can tell you halfway through the project whether or not you were the PI. And end it, right? They, they can say, sorry, yeah, they don't need you here anymore, mm -hmm. and you can't publish, you can't do anything. They have that amount of control. Mm -hmm. That's the tribes, it's the same thing. With some, some of the tribes that have them anyway, they do have that authority. And the thing that's interesting, though, here, and even Canada, I wonder, I mean, I don't know their federal sort of laws as well, so that's why I can't speak to whether they would be able to block it. Um, but even here in the U.S., one of the problems around, that's why I talk a lot about self-determination, is the issue, you know, of Congress still being able to step in, right, <laughs> and kind of um, usurping the, the, the power of tribes uh, and their ability to even stop. So they can stop them from coming in and doing the research, but they may not be able to stop them. What if the, the limits of that, what if you have tribal members who still want to talk to those people even though the tribal council said no based on the cultural protocol process? So these are one of the things in our department we had talked about that are challenges too with cultural protocols, but I think it's better as a, at least that they exist and that they're in place rather than not having them at all. Um, same with the thing up in Canada. I would imagine people can still, even if you know it's not approved, individuals will still talk to people. So then what do you do? That's why those four points that Nason made, like what, almost 30 years or 30 years ago are still true, right? Is that there are still, if an individual, we had this issue with some students and a faculty member several years ago who went up with, uh, talked to this um, artist at, at, Pomo, at the Pomo tribe and actually published information that never should have been, like, like about music or songs that were sacred songs. And we had to go back and say, you can't do that, right? Um, so these things happen, right? Particularly when the community, right? Just because this individual told you it was okay, and I don't even know if they checked with the individual or not. They just talked to them and then put it up. Um, but even if an individual tells you that, is it okay if the tribe <coughs> says no? Or if you go to a community org, right? Um, say people right want to go to Black Lives Matters or um, some other group, right, um, that's working with undocumented immigrants, and then we publish stuff that people said no, even when they had their cultural protocols in place. You know, this is where it gets a, a challenging so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you for this talk, it's really great. Uh, I was thinking about this through the lens of, of development and how relevant this is to kind of this, uh, the ideas around international development mm -hmm. and, and how much technology has also been used as kind of a substitute to um, empower communities or save humanity is kind of like the slogan. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that with you know the increasing use of technology as these like blanket um, solutions to a lot of the challenges we face. I was just in Greece working with refugees and I see all these people going in and trying to like put an app on it mm -hmm. kind of thing and I'm kind of wondering your thoughts mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. I had a um, guest speaker um, from Peru, uh, Eda Zavala, come and speak to my students in my American Indian education class and she talked a little bit about this. She writes she's working with indigenous peoples in the Amazon 
Um, and the importance, I think, of technology, I think it's all how we use it. So again, I think it becomes an issue of control. Like, there can be negative benef- uh, you know, aspects of technology. I mean, I think we're seeing it with the aftermath of the election and even with the election process itself in terms of how media has been used, right? Um, or saturated that the bottom line, I forgot who I was reading or who said this, but <coughs> someone was saying it's really important that we actually explore on our own just because you see something. It's so easy to hit the share button, for example, on Facebook when you see some story and not go and look and do the research yourself. Or it's very easy to say once we give people technology systems, right? Um, but what about, you know, when we're able to use technology to connect different communities? So, for example, Linda Smith's husband, who I was talking about, um, they actually were working on this project using GIS to actually connect the Pacific so that they had their own communication system to be able to talk with, you know, one another and get similar information about things that are happening, particularly because of the militarized um, um, U.S. influence um, and Japan's influence in large parts of the Pacific, so how they can respond to it. Um, so I think technology has a place, right? Um, I think um, communities contribute to the production of it too, but I think it's like any other thing that's a part of capitalism, right? To a certain extent is how people are able to access, use it, um, understand it, and its limits. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts on it. I mean, I don't think that it's an inherently um, bad or good, right? I think it is, m- in many cases, necessary, right? It's an issue of access, right? Mm-hmm. Which is one of the parts of research does is that people have to have the same access. Mm-hmm. Um, has a data center worked with anything else? Or is it just, when we do they still have a website? Or like the website, I think, is still up. I haven't checked yeah. in a while, um, right? And then um, I believe, because I had left the board um, before it um, decided to spin off, I believe the resources that were left and some of those things, they were siphoning off into a couple other different organizations. One of them um, was Movement <laughs> Strategy Center, I believe. And then I don't know which others they, they selected, but I think that because they had an endowment, um, like a million dollar endowment, um, which is also why I wasn't sure what happened, <coughs> why they couldn't just, but it's not easy, right? You can only access so much of that. So I think that was just moved, right, into other community based organizations along with reports and things that they had produced and the ideas of research justice. So it's continuing, I think, among folks who are doing the work. I mean, just since the book's been out over the last year or so, I keep, you know, running into people who are actually. <coughs> talking about it, one of the students who I had met at Mills College where they actually have a research justice um, scholars program where people can actually apply to be a research justice scholar. Um, some of you may know Julia Chinieri uh, Opera. Um, she was Julia Sudbury before that. Um, she um, uh, was the chair of ethnic studies at Mills. I think she's actually like uh, maybe provost or vice provost now. Did they finally yeah, make that final? I haven't talked to her in a bit. But Julia runs that program, or Chineri, um runs that program, and um, that's a fantastic site, I think, where the work's still going on. Um, Saba Wahid, who was up here in, salute, bless you, um, up here in the Bay Area for um, many years. She's down in UCLA working with that Labor Rights Center. I know they're doing a lot of research justice work, too. So I think there's definitely people who are still working on this, and I think in some ways that, that's why it probably was very good that the book was published. I do think it's a starting point because I think I'd like to see in the future more where the whole process, like every article or every chapter, everything that's written in it is by community members, right? Because everything in there, I mean, everybody's a community member, right? At, right. But that whatever's being written, like some of the pieces in there are written by the people who are actually also conducting the studies. Mm-hmm. That's not the case for everything that's in there. It's more about the process of conducting it. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Um, so <coughs> how do we take you know, the principles of this research justice framework we're dealing with that reality that some of our communities are really colonized. And if you ask them what the source of the problem is, what the problem mm-hmm. is, they're actually, I would say, wrong. You know, I grew up in East LA in the 1990s. If you ask people what the problem is, we need more cops, we need to throw more people in jail, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So there's a big assumption here that they already know, right? And I feel like, how do we work towards the fact that sometimes maybe they don't know, and that's part of the result of mm-hmm. their colonization, the result of mm-hmm. our this education or uneducation system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and how do we deal with that without romanticizing the quote-unquote community, right? As knowing everything, um, 
And I think the example you gave earlier about you know family members, you know, some of us come from dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, my family I have zero credit. Anything I say <laughs> with them, you know, probably sometimes good and sometimes bad. That's right? that's the answer to your question <laughs> right there, actually. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what you were saying about the um, does this still hold with like the bankers or the uh, real yeah, estate yeah. agents? Families are dysfunctional, right? So how do you treat dysfunctional family members? Not, I mean, it varies from family to family, right? Or how do you deal with them? You can either try to argue or you can try to switch their mind or you can back off or you just disassociate with. But I think the other part of it really is you understand that. If you're looking at the research participants, that's why we say if, you think, if we think about them as family members, we already we have the process where it's not always lovey-dovey, right? It also is that it's messy, it's challenging, there's disagreements, mm -hmm. there's conflicts, but that it's correlational, <laughs> right? And so even in the context where people say, oh, we need more costs, we need more of this, just like you need to do with the, the real estate person or the banker, because we've got to ask questions, right? And really get to what's underneath that, what's causing, just like this notion of saying of the white trauma or whatever, or call, that, that is because it's very subconscious, I think, in the case of that. But I think there's also the internal col um, colonial sort of experience of many folks in, in various communities. Um, so how do we actually talk with them, right? It's not to just walk in. So I'm not saying, and I don't think this is saying, as soon as you walk into the room at the, I'll just throw out an org I used to work with, the African American Art and Cultural Complex. Um, I don't think I'm just going to walk in and show up, right? Because I was on their board too, and we had a huge community. I mean, it was about, there was going to be a fight in there, right? Um, people had disagreements, they were pissed. I mean, it was bad, right? Um, and so I think in that case, that's, you have, the work is that you continue to build relationships. Part of the reason people were pissed, there hadn't really been a functional board. There was all this stuff going on with a new director. The people who they trusted maybe weren't doing, they didn't know every, all the things. And so sometimes it's about, this is where the, what is here is important is that it's about access to accurate information about your community and the situation of your community. So I think the other role, right, in research justice is to provide that. If people don't have access to, well, of course they think we need more cops. If the only place they're getting information is like TV or, um, friends or you know social media as you said and that's where that can be a problem so I think that is where it's the relational part is actually very important yeah. other questions comments thoughts yes um, I, I have a question but just a comment based right off that I, I, I work with students here um, to do uh, community engaged social movement history in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I've encountered a number of situations where students essentially, you know, in, in partnership with different um, activist organizations and they, in doing that history, rub up against really difficult his, sort of historical questions to iron out mm -hmm. across different activists organizations around similar movements, et cetera. And, and I, I continue to believe that sometimes these students, myself, because I'm involved too, that there, there can be really important productive roles in pushing questions that the <coughs> community, in this case certain mm -hmm. organizations, aren't raising themselves. And that, the way I that's heard you is like, that's the correlational that's part. That's right, yeah. And, but the point is to like, facilitate the spaces where we go to that together yes um, so I you know um, absolutely and that it, and that you can't ask all those questions right away right uh -huh. because they're like who the hell are you or you wouldn't even right. know them. yeah and I mean that's the part you know it, it's just it, you get you're into it you're deep into the work and it starts emerging wait a second here mm -hmm. there's there's uh, some real contradictions and tensions around these historical narratives and mm -hmm. And that's and trying to work that out is going to cause problems. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, these are the complications. Like to your point earlier too about like with the, with the tribes, even when they have these cultural protocols, I was saying, like I said, in place, or say a community had their sense of protocols. It doesn't mean the the group that gets to decide. First of all, who decides, right, and who gets to be on that group? Who are the gatekeepers, right? But even in that scenario, it doesn't mean they're right. What if there's still people in there? And so the other part we still continue to have to work with and reconcile with is processes for making sure that everybody's getting heard, even within community spaces, right, of what should be the problems. It reminds me of this work by Kathy Cohen, who writes on um, the boundaries of blackness, right? She talks about consensus and cross-cutting issues, where we kind of center particular, within a group, right? She's talking about African Americans, she's talking about HIV and AIDS, if you haven't seen her work. 
um, where we center usually issues as affecting everybody if they're consensus, when they actually don't, right? It's the, those who occupy more dominant roles within that particular community. So men, um, people from you know middle class to upper class backgrounds. Um, and then to the periphery, right, there's women, queer people, like that don't get, the, uh, the issues that are impacting them are put to the side, right? And she says that causes secondary marginalization. And I think the same can happen when we're deciding what to organize around, what research agendas, like even look right now with these protests, right? Who's leading them? Where are they at? What are the images of them? What do you decide to do? Like, I was moved by the image of folks saw it, of people holding hands around Lake Merritt. And then at the same time, I was like, well, you know, if we stop and even think about that as a moment, who decided that? And how did that, get, how did that happen? And does that even work? And then when you actually look at it, right, who was there? I, it's just been very interesting, these protests have been very interesting. Anybody see Saturday Night Live? Yeah. It's been very interesting because it does seem like folks of color sitting back watching white folks having counter <laughs> protest against each other to a certain extent, um, although the media would have us believe otherwise, to your point. Um, so it's just interesting, and I think this just speaks to the complications of, of, of all of this work and that we just have to, that's why research just I think is important because what it also is asking is just that we, if we come from a place of respect, that's why I talk about the sacred so much. It's not to sugarcoat people. We're so afraid and um, sometimes I think jaded by so that, that talking about things like the sacred or respect um, are like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm mad. Fuck the sacred, right? Like, I think that's where people are at sometimes. And it doesn't mean when you think about the sacred, that is also, it's actually holding people to account. It's not supposed to be about easiness. It's supposed to be about doing what we um, should be. Right? But I think that's really hard. That's really hard. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.